I'm really excited about this keynote talk um, by Kai and Sam from Google. So Kai is a hardware manager at Google, and Sam is a software engineer at Google. And they're going to talk about Cantrip OS. So an OS they're developing on, uh, on SEL4. I'm really excited about this, so I won't say anything more about it and let them tell you. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. So good morning. I just heads up. I haven't had coffee yet this morning, so uh, if I mess up, Sam's going to help fill in. So having that said, uh, let's start talking about uh, Cantrip OS, which is a part of a greater program that we have at Google. I'm going to spend a couple minutes to go over kind of like the high level overview of the Sparrow program, or what we call as Project Sparrow. And then we'll go over kind of like what this matcha system is that we assemble together that Cantrip OS runs on top of. And obviously <laughs> after that, we're going to dig into Cantrip OS and talk about any future work that we have in this area. So moving in. Um, so Google is an AI-first software company that is uh, providing services to our ecosystem of devices, both from a 1P perspective through our Pixel and other brand-related uh, things and through our P 3P ecosystem, which is the Android future uh, Pigweed, I guess. I'm not quite sure everybody heard of Pigweed. It's our embedded version of operating system that are on all devices from earbuds to various other things. And as AI innovation accelerate in this space, you know, moving from what we call the uh, ML 2.0 world to the 3.0 world with transformer-based models and large language models and moving away from the traditional mobile net CNN based architecture to you know, uh, tokenizers to you know, large models and whatnot, uh, we're beginning to realize that you know, there's a lot of challenges that are becoming like limitations to what we could deliver in terms of experiences. Like Moore's law is coming to an end. We cannot depend on transistors you know, doubling, quadrupling and every so often every few years. Uh, we, battery technology, on the other hand, is also not you know, advancing in a significant, significant pace. So in order to support some of these newer ML use cases, it's becoming more of a thermal power as well as you know, potentially, actually, no, really uh, security challenges as well in terms of privacy, especially when it encroaches on user information and data. Um, obviously, with you know, AI technology advancing the way they are, uh, having system that can support this uh, has been quite challenging, right? Because the compute requirements had you know, exponentially grew and the complexity of running these models now you know, gets, you know, pushes our device to essentially hit the thermal power limit. And pushing that to the limit as well also causes energy consumption to be significantly higher. So in order for us to deliver these experiences, we're essentially hitting the cap. So uh, without being able to depend on those things that I articulated earlier, we have to truly go after the co-design of the system from not just the accelerator perspective, from the no, total system perspective, right? Trying to basically extract every bit of uh, energy we could from the system to deliver or an enabling ex experience to be possible. And co-design is one of the ways that we approach that from both a hardware software perspective as well as a compiler perspective to making sure this workloads map relatively well to the device. Um, security privacy obviously is a very important factor as well. Uh, as these models get more advanced, personalization of the model to the user is you know, trending toward that direction, that direction with both personal agent and generative AI. Uh, trust, security, transparency, audibility, and privacy is like top of mind for what we want to achieve moving forward in the next few years, especially when, you know, users need to be able to trust that their data is secure and their privacy is respected, right? And, we, and you know, given also what's happening with Europe, uh, you know, clamping down and, and maybe in some cases banning these large models is an obvious concern. And you know, there are many ways that we're thinking about how to address it and obviously uh, transparency, audibility is one of them and there's obviously other ways to techno technological means to demonstrate that we you know, secure the user information as well as possible uh, from both a device perspective and as well as for, uh, from a model cascade perspective from device to our data center. Okay, so uh, what is Project Sparrow? So Project Sparrow is an open source initiative that aims to accelerate the development of secure, scalable, 
and efficient machine learning systems and subsystems as well. The goal of the project uh, is to develop and evolve a set of open source components that enable rapid prototyping, system exploration, and co-design of these newer generative AI systems. Uh, and the project is led by Google. We haven't fully announced it yet, and hopefully they do that in November timeframe. And it's supported by a number of companies, academia, and uh, other organizations as well. And the goal for this is to help accelerate the development and infrastructure for an ecosystem that could support the next generation of these use cases that are more secure and private. The North Star, obviously, to obviously enable new use cases, uh, reduce deployment and development time, as well as being as transparent as possible in both the development of the system as well as the deployment of the system as well. And uh, we're going to go over. The, oh, I'm so sorry. I did not catch up my fingers on the slides. I blame that on coffee, by the way. But before going into the co-design process of what we do and whatnot, and I'll be more diligent at pushing the buttons, uh, is a lot of people ask us, is like, you know, developing open source, so, open source software is great, but open sourcing hardware is a different challenge, right? Because nobody's going to spend millions of dollars to basically take an open source piece of uh, code from uh, GitHub, for example, and adapt it in hardware. So we are strategically, as I articulated earlier, partnering with IP providers uh, through the co-development process to have that ready and available when the time comes to, for that adoption to happen. And anything that we co-design from a system software perspective to hardware will be something that will be married together and be uh, provided by the providers as well, because we're not quite in the business of supporting hardware, if it makes sense, and we want to empower people to be capable of doing that and able to do that and monetize it as, as, you know, through the process. So back to the co-design process. So this should be nothing new for everybody here, uh, I assume. But you know, we start obviously with CUJs or KPIs, essentially, uh, or a new experience that we want to basically enable. And we set a set of metrics and benchmarks that we define that we want to meet. And from there, we generate a system description. Uh, we love to automate everything, but we can't, obviously. So some of these system descriptions will feed into engineering work from a compiler perspective. You know, we have custom instructions that we want to add to processors, accelerators, and whatnot will be incorporated. Uh, others will flow into ML models, how we quantize it, how we take advantage of sparsity, uh, as well as how we generate a reference application that articulates how sensor data comes in to how it gets uh, you know, accelerated through machine learning accelerators, as well as what do we do with that outcome. Right? And obviously, system software, right? And how all these things work together to ensure you know, that we have a very secure system, as well as hardware. So hardware is one place that is semi-automated. So we're able to describe the system using HJSON. And a lot of this technology was leveraged from the Open Titan project. Everybody aware of the Open Titan effort? Uh, yeah, perfect. So we leverage the same infrastructure that they use to basically uh, describe a system, right? Parameterizing a set of IPs as well as the inter interconnect and how the system all comes together into a reference design. And obviously, we have tools that take that XJSON and generate a system architecture model that feeds into our behavior simulator. So in the behavior simulator, we l work with the Ant Micro folks, and we use uh, Renode. Renode.io is a framework that they develop, develop uh, leveraged by ST and I believe uh, Microchip to basically mock up and simulate their SOCs, or I guess the, the microcontrollers, right? As well as uh, systems that you know they build around it uh, from a board perspective. So we're able to take our system description and generate a model for a behavior simulator. And the behavior simulator has a set of metrics from like performance counters to, I mean, obviously measuring automatically security is very <laughs> difficult, if, if not impossible. But in terms of like actual system performance, we're able to get metrics from both uh, cycle count as well as uh, preliminary estimates on like power performance area of the potential outcome of a chip that comes from that architecture. Uh, assuming that it's a standalone chip and not a subsystem. I guess we could also do it from a subsystem, but we haven't tried it yet. Uh, but the idea is to fail fast, right? We want to iterate through this loop as, as fast as possible. And if we do find that there are interesting outcome that we want to proceed to the next step, then we move into RTL simulation in which we use Veil later uh, sorry, we have VCS on there just to double check that our validator outcome actually matches. But the idea is that uh, final results, but takes a long time. And as we go down this process uh, into physical design, it gets even longer, but we get more accurate results. 
And we do run the entire system simulation with our system software, but a lot of that runs overnight because it takes significantly longer through that simulation, but we get you know, better results. And obviously, when we feel good about the outcome, uh, we work with our partners to generate a silicon proof point or an outcome, uh, of which then we could actually validate the silicon as a test chip to our simulation tools that, to make sure that we're doing, you know, obviously, the right things and the data and simulation results correlate. Uh, yes, so at the moment, and we want to get to completely open source for the whole flow, there's other teams that we're working with inside the company that is pushing and sponsoring uh, efforts about, around open road and sky water and whatnot. Uh, we haven't, unfortunately, incorporated all that stuff in uh, due to the fact it's a matter of risk averse, right? Because we're partnering with a company that makes silicon, we cannot just get them to shift to open source tooling, especially on the back end yet. So we're working to, to get there in 2024, 25, but at the moment we're still using, for example, design compiler and a lot of these other tools past the uh, RTL simulation layers into physical simulation. So quickly, what is the matcha system? So with the tools and stuff that we put together, as well as pieces of IP and technology and software, uh, we need something to go after. We want to demonstrate that we could actually generate a system that works and in a ML 3.0 kind of environment in kind of like the model cascade architecture of tokenizing all sensor inputs, uh, sending it to what we call as a medulla or the decision-making routing mechanism of whether feeding it to a local language model or data center language model. Uh, we want to tackle something that is more tangible. So we went after kind of like the tokenizer slash supporting the ML 2.0 ambient perception sensing capability uh, subsystem or system. So what we call that initially is what we, uh, sorry, is matcha essentially. Uh, named after all the T's following Open Titan, because obviously they have Earl Grey and we have matcha. Uh, we haven't figured out the next name yet, so if somebody has good ideas, let us know. Uh, essentially, it's an entire SOC that we're putting together, leveraging a lot of the open source uh, components from Open Titan, as well as enhancing that capability. Uh, and happy to go into more details offline or after this meeting. But essentially, it is a system that is fully capable of ambient perception sensing with onboard encoding capabilities and an ISP built in. And we have, and Sam will go into more detail about the construction of the system software aspects uh, that allows this chip serve as both a ambient perception sensing capable IC, as well as a first stage tokenization or tokenizer for both audio, IMU sensors, and as well as camera. Uh, we do have in partnership with uh, our, one of the IP partners to start open sourcing IP components beyond just the ones that are available in Open Titan, as well as the ones that we develop ourselves. And that will come, you know, come November timeframe when we talk in more details. Uh, as we articulated earlier with the simulation tools and whatnot and the system description, we do have a library of various components and IPs that we generate from both a hardware perspective, a software perspective in terms of models, as well as, you know, like Sam will go into more detail on the system software as well. Uh, having that said, uh, where we are currently, so we have all the tools and we plan to open source everything uh, come November timeframe. And from that point on, we plan to develop in the open. Uh, we are close to taping out our first chip come November, no, October timeframe. And we have everything running on FPGA currently. And we'll quickly show you a, a demo of this. Or has been developed for RTO emulation of our system co-design process. The FPGA emulates the IP of our system on the chip and is one of the critical steps in validating our co-design process. For this demo, we'll be showing an image-based ML use case. This is the Nexus board. We connect the camera and display to the Nexus board. The camera data is streamed into the Nexus board and stream onto the display. We also connect the Nexus board to the host machine by UART and SPI interface. The host machine can monitor and see the camera images. On the Nexus board, we boot up a secure core, a system management core, and an ML core. The secure core is a bootloader to start SMC core and ML core. 
the SMC core initialized both the display and the camera. It also set up an interrupt handler for the camera module. Once an image frame is ready on the memory, the camera module triggers an interrupt to SMC core. The interrupt handler will trigger ML core to start computing the presence score. The interrupt handler also prints the image frame on the display. After the present score is computed, the score will be shown on the display. Here is the live demo. The camera is live playing on the display and the host machine. On the display, score 0 and 1 are shown on top of it. Each score has a range between minus 128 to 127. The higher the score, the more likely a person could be in the image. The score zero means the likelihood of a person in the camera field of view. The score one means the likelihood of a second person in the camera field of view. There is no person in the camera field of view. Both scores are in a very low negative range. We have a person in the camera now. The score zero changes from negative to positive and the score is very high. Even though the person moves and rotates, the score is still high and it indicates a person in the camera field of view. We have two people in the camera field of view now. As we can see, both score 0 and 1 are positive and very high. It means the two people in the camera field of view are successfully detected. So as, as Kai described, um, the software aspects that I'm going to talk about are part of a much larger project. And you need to understand that they're purpose-built for what we are trying to deliver. So it's not a general purpose system, but we do have some general aspects to it that uh, hopefully will lend itself to reuse in other ways. So the, the hardware as Kai presented, has three cores. Um, a secure core, security core, which is running, well, it's derived from Open Titan, so it gives us a root of trust, and it runs Talk OS, and it boots the system. It also provides some other services, but I'm not gonna say much at all about it. And then we have the system management core, which is the main focus of the talk today. And it runs SEL4 as the kernel. And then on top of the uh, SEL4 kernel, we have a user space which is all written in Rust and derived from Campus. And I'll go into some of the aspects of this uh, here, but I'm gonna try and stick to a high level. Um, what you're gonna notice if you look at the slides that are online is that uh, the, the deck has a bunch of bonus slides that give deep dive into certain areas. So if you find something a little confusing or you want more information, check the slide deck first to see if there's slides that provide that detailed information. So um, this slide shows you the key aspects or the key pieces of Cantrip OS. Um, some of you may have heard it called Kata OS before, but someone beat us to that name, so we had to rename it. Um, actually, the most serious side effect of having that happen was that we lost our Git history because <laughs> we switched. We had to like rename repos, or we rename repos, and now I can't like go back into Git history. Um, and the only reason I mention that is because later on in the year, as Kai mentioned, we're going to open source everything. And what we've been doing up to now, um, we've been giving out sort of snapshots of code as we go along. Um, we have to use this procedure, which is required by Google, to ensure that we don't disclose internal information. So we actually copy data out. And you get, uh, as a result, out on GitHub, when you look in the Git repos, you get a Git log that um, shows CLs merged and things like that. So you don't get a full idea of how the development process went on and why decisions were made. But when we open source everything, hopefully the Git history will all be there. And that's the only reason I mention it. Anyway, so 
as I have up here, um, you can see there's a quite a laundry list of things. I'm going to go into each one of those uh, pieces individually uh, to try and talk about things. Um, the key thing, as I said, is that all this is open source. So we use the SEL4 kernel, as I mentioned, and um, it's, it's just stock SEL4, although unfortunately, uh, prior to my joining the project, um, the people that worked on the kernel mods to do the platform support for our platform um, kind of uh, used a heavy hand in terms of adding their code in. And so we lost um, normal support for RISC-V 32-bit systems, um, and the kernel basically was forked. So, um, so, it, so it lags a little behind the upstream kernel. I periodically check, especially when there's problems and so on. However, um, in addition to uh, being forked and not moving forward, um, we have made some local changes that are, are kind of critical to our needs. Um, you have to remember our target platform is one RISC-V core uh, for, for the SEL4 kernel. is one RISC-V core, and in addition, um, we have only four megabytes of memory. And in fact, we want to get to an even smaller memory footprint, which I'll talk about later. So in support of that, um, we added changes to the kernel to support uh, reclaiming the memory that the root server takes when it runs. So as I said, our system is campus based So the kernel uh, boots up, inst initializes the system using the root server, which in our case is our own, our, our own rewrite of CapDL loader. And then after, CapDL, after the root server runs and instantiates the campus components, we then turn around and yank back all the memory that the root server was utilizing. And this is important for us. So the user runtime, as I mentioned, is 100% Rust. Um, anyone who's writing system software these days seems to want Rust. It's very popular. Um, there are a lot of important properties to it, especially memory safety. Um, some other things that I've listed here. And what we've done is um, incrementally move our system to the point where it's now 100% Rust in, at the runtime. And uh, by doing that and not, I, so initially when we started the system, when we started working on the system, we used Campus with all the C generated uh, glue code and so on. And that provides boundaries in the compilation process that the optimizer doesn't really pass, go past. And so by switching over to 100% Rust, we can now, the compiler can now see the stack top to bottom and can do optimizations. And for example, I was surprised the other day that I, I was working on an optimization where I'm moving, um, I'm moving something into, into Flash and um, the LTO, the link time optimizer, uh, saw that I wasn't actually referencing any of the, the data in certain symbols and just removed the entire set of symbols. So like this, this half megabyte archive that smashed into the CapDL loader image just went away. I didn't need to like add a configuration knob or anything. And this is all a byproduct of the fact that the, uh, the Rust compiler, at least in this case, was able to see everything top to bottom. So the other uh, key pieces in terms of being able to be uh, to, to write all your code in Rust is that we need to have some glue code that binds the kernel configuration to the Rust runtime. So you get all the things like, are you using MCS and, and so on. And so we have a crate that uh, syncs during the build process. What the, you have to build the kernel first and then it dredges the config.h file out of the build artifacts, turns that into Rust features, and uses that to drive the Rust comp compilation process. So, as I said, we're using Campus, or at least some bits of it still. Um, we started off, as I said, just a normal Campus application with C glue code generated by the Campus tools, the user tools. Um, and then over time, we've replace the interface specifications, the, the, uh, um, gotten rid of the interface specifications and replaced the templates, the campus templates, with new templates that generate Rust code. 
And that's the path we took to get to 100% rust. And um, it, it actually was very simple to do. Um, it just took a lot of time debugging <laughs> early on because I misunderstood how, the, how certain things worked in Campus. And I implemented them the way I thought they should and not the way they really were. <laughs> and so I, it took a while to debug things because there were very subtle uh, issues that arose during startup and so on. But in addition to just switching over to Rust from C, um, which lets you ditch the SCL4 runtime library and muscle lib C especially, which turns out to be a memory hog, um, we've added a few things here that are needed. Um, and a lot of them, uh, the, the ones at the top, like uh, thread suppression and IRQ consolidation and so on, um, are, were added in, in pursuit of reduced memory footprint. And I'll talk about some of those later. Um, I should say that the other principle that we had in terms of doing this campus work was that we wanted to make sure, that we, one of the things that I did, did not really agree with in terms of what campus does is I didn't want any generated code, if at all possible. All I wanted campus to do was basically do resource assignments, global, global resource assignments, packaging, and then get out of the way. <laughs> and so if you look at our generated code, you'll find that it's basically just definitions. And then all the libraries support the runtime functionality. And you can actually write everything you want without even uh, using any templates. So as I said, um, we have our own version of the root server. Um, this was my introduction to SEL4 and Rust. Um, it was kind of jumping into the deep end. So um, I was totally paranoid about breaking things. And I didn't fully understand everything. And so what I did was kind of a faithful re-implementation of the C code in Rust to start. Um, and then as I got a little more understanding, I sort of diverged here and there. And um, you know, as I mentioned before, we do this memory reclamation process. Um, the root server has to participate in that. Um, the other interesting, potentially interesting thing that I did was that there's mechanisms for shared memory pages. So if you have a page that is specified in CapDL as used in multiple components, um, the loader will, uh, you have to enable a flag that the loader will uh, use to dupe all the capabilities that might be used this way. And instead what I did was a, a sort of a, a riff on copy on write where I check to see if I map the page and I get an error back that says it's already in use, in which case I then dupe it. And the reason for doing that is that it reduces the size of certain tables in the root server significantly. So instead of needing like 2x the size of a, of a, data t uh, of a table, you can get away with you know like 50 extra. So um, the other pieces that are uh, specific to our root server are listed here. Um, I, I also wanted to mention that, as I said, this was my first foray into all this stuff. And I, I naively thought, oh, um, you know, as, as, I, as I showed in a previous slide, we do um, dynamic creation of applications and new threads and so on. And I thought, oh, I'm going to write this code once and reuse it. And it turned out I, I, I was mistaken. So. Um, so I originally had grand plans and, and then learned otherwise. So as I said, I'm going to go down through the different components and talk about um, what they do a little bit at a high level. Um, the next one on the list is the memory manager. So we do system-wide dynamic memory management. And um, there are existing SEL4 libraries that work within a particular component, but don't necessarily cross between components. What we do is provide a service that you say, give me these SEL4 objects in an IPC message, and they come back attached to the IPC messages capabilities to the new objects. And that lets you uh, allocate memory and create objects uh, smaller than a page. You don't need to go to untype memory at all. 
you just get the, pit, the objects themselves directly. And you can do that from any process that has privileges to talk to the memory manager, which is limited. I guess I didn't point out also that this, these slides, we, we sort of classify uh, different components in the system, different pieces as to how much trust we give them and also whether they run in uh, protected mode, whether they have memory management bounds, guardrails, um, which varies mostly over in the talk area. So on the left-hand side is, is the, uh, this is the security core, this is the SMC, and this is the machi machine learning core. Anyway, so, um, so the memory manager is, is kind of re, um, simplistic. Um, it's very hard, at least for me, to write a good memory manager on SEL4 um, because of the constrained view the kernel gives you of untyped memory. Um, one of the things that we currently have to require is that everyone, when they're releasing objects, uh, tells the memory manager to free up the objects. And that's how we keep a central uh, database of, of state. Um, I've thought about how to improve that, and um, we, we may have some changes in the future. Um, but right now, it's really hard for us to do uh, sort of an optimized allocator. So we just do a very, very simple allocator that works for our needs. So as I said, it's important to us to be able to run applications, uh, really dynamic applications. So they're either loaded from built-in bundles that are incorporated in the system image or there could be sideloaded, like brought in through serial or network or so on. Um, they're totally untrusted. Um, we put them in a sandbox. Uh, language agnostic, as I said, we, I've, I've simplified the environment significantly for these applications, so they're single-threaded. And our expectation is that you'll use, if you need multiple threads, you'll bring in your language's favorite runtime package that gives you multi-threading. That may turn out to be, you know, too limited. Um, we'll find out that we're still kind of a work in progress. And remember, we have specific goals that we need to uh, support certain applications. Um, so eventually the intent is that the security core will um, validate the signature on the executables as well as validating the booting process. So another service is the ML coordinator. This is just a generic job scheduler. Um, it has some smarts about memory management in the uh, ML core. We've actually gone through multiple iterations of ML cores. Do we have two or three? I was trying to figure out if Malamud is, okay, two. Okay, so there's an initial, You'll see, if you actually look through the code, you'll see vestiges for two, two different designs. One which is called Springbok, which was more ambitious. And it was an implementation derived from the RISC-V vector core, RISC-V RISC vector instruction set extension, so RVV. Um, but in addition, <clears throat> it had uh, windowed MMU, so you could have multi-tenant support, so you could have multiple ML models con uh, loaded concurrently, resident in the ML core. Um, we, we went through that design and concluded that um, a simpler design was better for our needs. And so the, the system now also supports another core that we call Kelvin. And um, it only supports a single job running at a time, um, much simpler uh, uh, semantics in terms of like, how do you do fault handling and things like that. The other one was trying to be very, very general purpose. Um, this is much simpler. So the ML coordinator is responsible for loading models, for running them, for scheduling them, um, taking care of when they fail and reporting results back to applications and so on. Um, so the last, the last piece that I was gonna talk about is the security coordinator. So this is the piece of software that runs on the SMC, on SEL4, and talks to Open Titan, talks to the security core. And um, there's not a whole lot to do right now because Open Titan or the security core is responsible for booting up 
uh, the system. And once it's done, all it does is provide um, is provide access to the uh, storage on the security core. So all the critical resources that are needed to be protected on the system are, are hidden on the other side of the security core. So when we want to run something like load an application into memory, we have to go to the security core and ask it to bring it to us from, from Flash. And other than that, um, the security core doesn't do much, doesn't do much at all uh, at the moment. Uh, eventually, it has all this crypto functionality that's in Open Titan that uh, wasn't really ready for us to use early enough. Um, now it's there, and now we need to uh, integrate that functionality. So that's, that's Cantrip OS. That's the system. That's the runtime. That's how it sits on top of SCL4. I was going to talk very briefly about um, uh, some of the tools we've developed uh, in the process of building this software um, and, and sort of why, uh, in some aspects, in some, in some cases, why we went to the effort. So, so SEL4GDB is a set of tools that were developed by Ant Micro. Um, is this person Marcin, his last name is Polish and I'm not sure I can say it correctly. <laughs> so instead of butchering it, I'll just say that Marcin is just, is just an amazing programmer. And uh, he did several things. He did the root server memory reclamation and he also did this Cell4GDB uh, system. And it is uh, used entirely with Renode at the moment because it depends on Renode for doing things like trapping context switches and using that information to build up mapping tables from thread names to TCBs and so on. And it gives you a very, very, you know, important mechanism for debugging and developing software. So you can refer to threads by name, you can breakpoint going in and out of the kernel, you can say when I, when I return to user space, stop. You know, so the very first instruction that you hit when you return to user space out of the kernel, it'll breakpoint, so you may not know exactly which thread you want to get into. Um, you can set symbolic breakpoints per SEL4 thread, not just per threads that GDP knows about, and so on. Um, and, and we use this extensively, and it, it's all available. Uh, I, I wanted to mention logging, so um, we just hook into the Rust log crate and pass everything by IPC message to, uh, in normal operation, we have a console. And so the, the thread on the console receives these messages and sends them to the UART so you can see them. Um, if you have a UART driver. So we will eventually get to what platform support there is. But um, how much time do I have? Plenty of time. But, um, but in, in lieu of that, if we don't have a console, um, we're going to need something else, probably a circular ring buffer of some sort that we can just dump things into and then manually extract at a later time. The expectation is that most of the deployed usage of the system, there will be no console, there will be no UART. Um, so this is just normal stuff. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of ugliness in here. Um, it really needs a redesign, uh, as you can see. But you get an idea. So what, what we do typically when we're writing our code is we throw in uh, trace requests, trace logging into our code to give critical information about how thing functions. And then um, we can use the logging in a debug build to see the scenario about you know, how it got from here to there and so on. Um, in a release build, we optimize these out to save space, um, which sometimes isn't what you want. So we have mechanisms for turning them on in release builds. So uh, another key area that we did a lot of work in terms of developer tools was reducing the memory usage, the memory footprint. Um, you have to understand that um, not only is the uh, CapEx dependent on the memory footprint, you know, how much you pay for a chip that is gonna be the end result, how much memory you have to devote to running the system, but you also have power uh, aspects. So, you know, the more memory you have on your system, the more power you're gonna draw. You're gonna, uh, you know, drain your battery faster and so on. Um, Ring just put out a camera, a really interesting camera. It's a battery-operated uh, 
doorbell, I guess, camera that does feature de object detection and runs on two AA batteries for two years. So they clearly, we, we, our goals are similar and they, they clearly have done something like what we're doing. But the, the reason I bring this up is you, in order to reach those goals, you, you really need to look at all the things that run in your system, including the memory. And, um, and so <clears throat> we've spent a, an awful lot of time uh, tuning the system, tweaking things, adding knobs and configuration parameters here and there, trying to make things general in order to reduce memory usage. So for example, uh, threads cost a lot, SEL4 threads. And the overhead there is significant. So we have mechanisms for repurposing threads. So like the control thread in a campus component is almost universally never used. And so what you do is you say, I have an interface thread that handles like an RPC uh, service of some sort. You say, don't give me a thread for that. I'm going to run it in the, con in the control thread. And that gets rid of a thread. Um, stuff like that. Um, they're very simple tweaks, um, but they end up having uh, a lot of impact. And the way we measure the impact is we have tools. So one of the uh, tools we have is this kmem.shell script, which actually looks at the AST generated by the campus tools and gives you a breakdown per component or if there's like shared objects or objects that are shared between components, it breaks those out separately. And it's, it's aware of how, well, since it looks at the AST, it only looks at real page frames. As we look at the next one, we'll see that it, that gets confused because it's, uh, it, it's not CapDL aware. Um, but it, uh, the KMEM script looks at uh, the AST so it can see exactly which page frames are allocated, see the accounting. It, can also, it also accounts for all, <coughs> all the system, uh, system memory, the system objects that are allocated for it. So you get a full picture uh, of the system broken down. And this is very useful in terms of trying to locate like where unexpected memory use is. Within a component, um, we also use this other tool, which is just uh, available on GitHub called Bloaty, which um, gives you a breakdown of the most expensive pieces within a, a, an executable binary. And since the components themselves are packaged up into executable ELFs, um, you can then use this tool just to break it down, and I've shown you an example. Um, however, you have to be a little careful using it because um, Bloaty doesn't understand about the mechanism, <coughs> excuse me, the mechanisms provided um, in CapDL or CampGIS rather. So for example, stacks have a guard page at the top and the bottom. Those are just unmapped pages, but they show up as allocated pages here to Bloaty. So, so what we're missing right now, th these tools have been very useful. What we're missing is um, it would be really great to be able to see like how deep the stack gets in each thread so you can tune your stack sizes. Um, the other thing that um, would be useful and should be really simple is um, in order to reduce the overhead of the root server, you want to constrain data structure sizes in the root server. And, but, but it's sort of a, a two iteration process. You have to build your campus system boot the system, see how big, uh, how many objects are instantiated and so on, and then use that to size your data structure. So it's a two-stage effort, um, but it should be possible to do that, um, in, you know, to do that automatically for you. Um, so the, the last sort of uh, programming related thing, I think, yeah, is uh, something we call CapScan. So, okay, thank you. That, really, that's all I have? Okay, okay, I'll go real quick. Um, I'm almost done. So early on, um, when I was doing, we do capability passing, and um, I'd lost a capability. And so what I wanted to do was figure out where in the system is the capability. 
And what I thought about doing was writing a worm, basically, that, that traverses um, between all the components and searches the C tables, the C nodes, for the capability. But that was, that was too difficult. So, inst <laughs> so instead, I just um, built this little mechanism that dumps the C tables. You, you give it a C node, and it'll uh, give you a list of all the caps in there. And that's turned out to be very useful. So um, people have seen this, and I think Nick may talk about syscall wrappers later. I'm just going to skip this so we can talk about future work. Do you want to come up, Kai? And we can. <clears throat> so as we've, um, as Kai said earlier, um, we're, we're working towards open sourcing everything. Do you want to talk? Yeah, so we're planning to open source everything come November timeframe. We haven't decided yet as to do that at the RISC-V Summit or not. So there's two choices, RISC-V Summit or the Chips Alliance meeting that's happening during November timeframe. So roughly around early November is when we plan to open source our entire repository. And we'll also post that uh, announcement in the Google open source blog, as well as uh, any associated media related uh, things with our partners. We haven't sorted out all the details yet. It's very early, but the intent is early November. And we'll also give uh, examples of how to build our entire system and run it on both our, sorry, our Nexus platform is after StarCraft. I mean, you probably should not mention it, but, uh, but uh, also on and working with a university to figure out if we could actually get that running on a regular Xilinx board as well, because we want be people to be reproduce the artifacts both in terms of the Reno simulation as well as on the FPGA platform. So we plan to have instructions for people to be able to do that uh, on, on, on a, a web page that we haven't actually uh, exposed yet. <laughs> oh. Yeah, and as I was saying earlier, we're going to open up the, the, the master repository directly so you can see more of the artifacts, the logs, and things like that. Yeah, the, the master repository will essentially be similar to Android and Chrome. It will most likely be on a... Uh, Garrett repository with repo commands for you to in it because we have a composition of I think sixty plus projects in there. Yeah, yeah. So we want to make sure that you could take advantage of the repo command, repo in it, and whatnot, and sync that entire repository down. Okay. Um, so as you can see, we are dedicated to uh, run on our specific platform. I did a uh, ARD sixty four Raspberry Pi. Uh, implementation real quick on Kimu in order to demonstrate how to use it. Um, people really haven't picked up on that. That's not surprising. It was a little daunting probably to get going. And then we have a bunch of other functionality that we want to uh, work on. Um, as was mentioned, we, we are focused on um, uh, ML applications that require more processing than we can do on the edge. And uh, in that regard, um, we're looking to integrate um, something like Project Oak, which is a GitHub repository, which allows you to uh, talk to uh, um, a trusted execution environment data center. So as part of that, we need to figure out networking. So, so I think that's it. We have no time for questions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to make time for a couple of questions. So first one with the hands up gets to ask a question. Anyone? All right. I'll do two. <laughs> so in hindsight, if the micro kit was available at the time you started and you would have adopted that, how much pain would that have saved? None. <laughs> well, there, there's... There's no generation of code. Um, there's no single, th no f multi threaded components. Um, it's written in C. Hey? Eh? It's written in C. <laughs> it's written in C. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, I, um, maybe I'm being too flipped, but it, it, it would have been an improvement for sure. But I think there was such a steep learning curve regardless that. Um, <coughs> I, I, I can't quantify, you know, how much of an advantage it would be. Uh, so, sorry, uh, just a quick question about the Open Titan side of things. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, that's that's on an Arctic Seven board. Uh, would the opening up would, would that enable if you partner with the university to get it on, say, a ZCU one hundred and two that could support QSPF twenty eight 
uh, interfaces is, is what's the direction with Open Titan? Thanks. So I believe the current Open Titan does fit on an RTX platform. Uh, however, I think the recent reincarnation or iterations of it, uh, they upgraded from the RTX platform to a Kintex platform. So I don't remember off the top of my head what version of that is uh, in terms of like signing dev board that supports. But yeah. But our, our, our RTL does Quad Spy, I thought. He was asking for QSpy. Yeah, our platform does have that. Yeah, so our RTL may be a little different than what you get directly from Open Titan. Yeah. We, we derive from Open Titan. Right. And, and maybe to answer a part of the question that I may not have heard correctly as well, but uh, when we build all this infrastructure beyond Open Titan, uh, we're likely going to require a bigger FPGA than what uh, Open Titan requires, and we'll provide specifications for that on the website. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you. too very much.